Hello, and thanks for streaming The Near Futurist, a show presented by me, Guy Clapperton. This is a fortnightly look at the technologies that are going to affect our lives in, wait for it, the near future. I'm in my mid-50s. I know it's impossible to tell from the photos. Even so, I managed to be a fashion icon, which, now that I think about it, is also impossible to tell from the photos and also the clothes I wear. The thing is, people who are seriously interested in what they wear tend to buy things that are in season, which means a polo shirt may be the wrong colour, but have ages of wear left in it. A related issue is the amount of short-term fashion manufacturers put together – clothes, shoes, or whatever – that last about five minutes, then fall to pieces. That's obviously an exaggeration, but short-termism is an issue if we don't want the planet to suffer damage. One possible answer to this, and a number of other ecological issues, is graphene. And to discuss this, my guest is a graduate engineer with over 20 years of senior level experience in manufacturing and engineering companies. He's demonstrated success in introducing and commercializing new technology, including materials and coatings for diverse sectors including aerospace, Formula One, and also including significant work in the oil and gas sector. He was appointed to the advisory board of the United States National Graphene Association in February 2018. He's chief executive of graphene specialist Versarian, and his name is Neil Ricketts. Neil, welcome. Thank you very much, guys. Pleasure to join you today. Uh, that's great. Well, thank you for your time. Let's start with a little role play. I'll play the podcaster who's just basically cut and pasted your profile from your company website, and you can tell me a bit about what it all actually means. For example, what exactly is graphene? So graphene is one of those things that's been around now for about 18 years. It was discovered by two Russian professors at the University of Manchester. They used a, a piece of sellotape with graphite that you would find in a pencil, and they effectively took that material apart layer by layer until they isolated graphene. The graphene had been talked about since the 1920s, but it, it was a theoretical thing. We never thought that it would be stable enough to exist in the real world. So that transition from the theoretical world to the physical world happened uh, in the mid-2000s. A few years went past whilst they got all their academic papers uh, and learned what they discovered and tested it thoroughly. And then around about 2012, things started to become more exciting as uh, they were awarded a, a Nobel Prize for Physics uh, for this absolutely outstanding discovery of how to isolate graphene from graphite. The question everybody's going to ask is, you know, well, that's great, but, you know, what, what impact does it have to me? And in 2012, little was known. We didn't know how to make graphene, and we definitely didn't know how to actually incorporate that into the devices and, and the things that we see around us on a day-to-day -day basis. So that work, again, took a few years. But in 2017, 2018, the first product was launched, which was a very, very expensive $1.3 million watch, which was the lightest watch of its kind ever made by Richard Neely. And that used academics from the University of Manchester and uh, guys from my company, uh, the subsidiary 2D Tech in Manchester, to actually incorporate graphene into carbon fiber. And when you start to see these technologies start to be incorporated into things like concrete and plastics and the new wave of new materials that we require as a society, then that's when, for me as an engineer, it becomes really, really exciting. Okay, now, chemically, I understand it looks basically like carbon with regular patterns in its molecules, but it's not crystalline, therefore it isn't diamond. I mean, can you tell me what it actually, is it just carbon? What exactly is it? it, it in its purest sense, it's a single sheet of, graf, of graphite or carbon atoms uh, that come from, from graphite, as I said before. So imagine that you're thinking about something which is probably one and a half million times smaller than a human hair. So uh, for myself as an engineer, you know, when I first started, I used to think I was very, very clever, you know, making things to thousands of an inch. And when I was in the Formula One industry and supplying great teams in there, we made things to microns. And I thought I was very, very clever. And then, then you realize, actually, that, you know, you can make these devices at an atomic level. And that's the science that we're really, really trying to you know, understand at the moment. This is a completely different way of looking at the way that materials are actually formed and created. Uh, at an atomic level. So there's a microscope up at the University of Manchester, which is able to look at individual atoms. Now, for me, I can remember back to my school days, and I'm sure you can, when we talked about atoms and you know protons and neutrons and electrons, we kind of really didn't understand it. Uh, and we kind of you know nodded gleefully at the, at the teacher. But actually, now you can actually see them. And for me, that's, that's when the science comes alive. 
That, that, that is fascinating. I do remember being told at school that they would never th- develop a camera that could actually see atoms. It was a ridiculous uh, idea. And of course, like all ridiculous ideas from my childhood, it's more or less, uh, it's more or less come true. I introduced this podcast by speaking about clothing, I mean, partly because this podcast is Dad Joke Central, but also because uh, I believe you're doing something interesting with Superdry. I wouldn't have thought about carbon in the clothing industry being a thing. Do, do tell me more. Well, the textile industry is going through a bit of a change, as, as most industries are, you know, not least the oil and gas industry, renewables and, and so on. So the textile industry, uh, is, I, I was never exposed to the textile industry uh, other than being a consumer until a few years ago. And you learn how fascinating, uh, actually, the, the most mundane things that you take for granted yeah, and how complicated the manufacturing method is for creating those things. But if you take like a plain white T-shirt, takes five gallons of water to manufacture in its processing, you know, the environmental impact of such industries such as textiles, which we may not consider to be that harmful to the environment, actually they are. And, And they've now come to the conclusion that this new generation that's coming along will not tolerate the kind of relatively wasteful way that we've been operating in our generations. They will not tolerate it. They'll want to keep their clothes longer. They'll want them to be more functional. They'll want them to to last the the ravages of of being worn. And they're not going to be, in the view of all of the experts, as fashion conscious as we are now. A lot of the clothes that are bought now don't actually ever see the, the light. They're bought online. They're unwrapped, put into the wardrobe. They sit in the wardrobe for two years, and then they find their way to landfill. And, and that is such a wasteful kind of practice that everybody is now really, really concerned about not only what materials we're using in the construction of those garments, but how we actually use them. And so for me, that's a big challenge that, uh, that technology such as graphene can kind of overcome. I was going to come to that. Why was Superdry interested specifically in graphene and, of course, in Vesarium? Yeah, we're both... Uh, very local to each other. We, we're in uh, the Forest of Dean. Superdry's headquarters are in Cheltenham. We know the guys, we bump into them at various events. And we started having a dialogue with a couple of their guys that were designing their new ranges. And so the question is, what does graphene do? So graphene does one of three primary things. It changes the thermal conductivity. It changes the electrical conductivity. So it's one of the best conductors in both those areas. But it also changes the mechanical properties of any material that we tend to put it in. And the staggering thing is, if you take something like concrete, we put less than 1% into concrete of our graphene product, and it can improve the physical strength by 30 40 50%. So again, this is kind of staggering for the engineering professions that such a small quantity of such a uh, a relatively simple material can have such a dramatic effect on the physical properties of these products. In Superdry's case, we've been able to demonstrate that if you print on the inside of the material with a graphene ink, uh, you can change the thermal characteristics of that. And so, actually, if you want a garment that's going to last longer and perform better, then you need to make it better in the first place. And that's where the graphene actually comes into its uh, in, into its use. You know, that is predominantly what we're trying to do we're trying to make any application or any material that we're using much better not only for the environment but for the end user do you want to sound as confident as my interviewee in this episode if you talk to the press or other media are you worried you'll be misquoted or they'll just publish their story and not yours clapperton media associates can help with coaching drop me a note guy at clapperton.co.uk and we'll arrange a time for an exploratory call. Now, back to the podcast. As we mentioned earlier, you've already touched on some of the other industries that you uh, uh, work in. Uh, What does graphene add to, say, automotive or aerospace? You know, I don't know about you, but you know, I used to take meetings in Spain as though I was going to, to, to Gloucester. You know, it it was quite a wasteful society that we were living in pre-COVID. And I think a lot of people have revised the way that they think about doing things or at least consider doing things in a different way. And so for me, the aerospace industry and the uh, the car industry are going through the same things. I've been involved in the car industry since I was an apprentice when I was you know, 15, 16 years old. And it was all about twin cam engines and you know petrol engines and a massive petrol head. 
But actually, uh, I was talking to someone yesterday, I really don't think we'll have petrol cars in the near future. And so Elon Musk and Tesla have done a fantastic job of bringing that technology to uh, the masses. But now it's causing other challenges. You know, what do we do about cobalt? What do we do about lithium? Is there a better way of making batteries? And graphene has the answer to some of those problems. You know, we can make better systems. And in fact, we're currently supported by, by the UK government to look at moving vehicles on port side. Containers come in, they have to be moved to, to the lorries and uh, the ships. It's a very, very wasteful environment in terms of the amount of diesel and uh, emissions that are generated. So they want to move to electric. And I think we'll see electric being far far more common in applications that we've never considered. Heating at home is a classic example. If you go to China, they have masses of renewable energy uh, and electricity is, is in abundant supply. So they use electric heating in their flats and apartments, whereas we would use a conventional gas boiler. We already know that the government are not going to let us do that in the near future. So we're going to need to find solutions. And again, graphene can have a really, really good impact on that by producing flexible, very highly efficient heating elements that are built into your wall so you don't even see them. Right. And I know you do all sorts of other uh, things. There's uh, biome uh, biomedical is another one of your specialist areas. It's all very interesting. But uh, when we get down to it, I understand graphene is frighteningly expensive to produce. Um, how do you, you and your partners cope with that? Well, there's different types of graphene. So there's a whole portfolio of materials. As I said to you before, graphene in its purest sense is a single sheet of carbon atoms. And that's very expensive to make. And that will find uses when we want to replace things like ITO on uh, mobile phones, or we want to create sensors, which are, are very, very precise. At the other end of the scale, you have the more industrial processes. So I've no doubt that when cement came along, that that was probably an expensive process as well. But as the volumes increase, it's now the eighth biggest come dark side producer you know, in existence. So these things, they build up and they become part of our normal life. We don't, we don't now consider concrete to be special as it would have been at the time. You know, imagine being around when they created steel. I mean, they went from cast iron to being able to you know, build bridges and ships and railways. And, you know, it would have been a truly fantastic time. And I think that's what we're seeing with graphene. I think we're seeing a time when we can challenge what's already gone and look for new ways uh, of doing things which are far better, not only for the environment, but as I say, for the end user. That makes a lot of sense, uh, although there are other drawbacks. I've been doing a little bit of research. I mean, aerospace, for example, is an interesting industry. You've also mentioned uh, you know, intensive, more intensive industries and manufacturing and things like that. They all involve a lot of heat, and there can be, say, oxygen involved. And I understand heat and oxygen is kind of death to graphene. How do, how do you make it safe? So it's all about, so as I said to you before, graphene in its purest sense is just pure carbon. But when you want to, it to do special jobs, you can then create different groups of molecules around the outside of the graphene, which can enable it to do lots and lots of different jobs. So it can be soluble in water. It can be insoluble in water. It can, it can carry drugs to different parts of the body where it can find tumors. There's lots of ways in which you can actually flavor graphene. And, and so... When people talk about graphene, they tend to talk about one thing, but it's not actually one thing. It's a whole family. The other thing is that graphene is just carbon, and that is the first of probably two to 4,000 new materials that can be treated in the same way. So we're already looking at uh, graphene sister. You know, uh, hexagonal boron nitride is called white graphene uh, because obviously graphene is black and, and hexagonal boron and nitride is white, but they share some very similar properties in the way that they alter the mechanical performance of other materials, but they have some differences as well. So this really is like the dawn of a new age. So if we want to create space travel and we want to create much, much, much more efficient vehicles, whether that be air, sea, rail or car, then graphene has a part to play in almost every aspect of those industries. Okay, uh, I, you, you may have anticipated my next question, actually, with the different forms of graphene. But uh, another thing I came across was it's quite toxic in sheep form. Is that uh, a matter of using different forms of it? Or uh, how do you get around that? Toxicity, this is a new science. Not everything is known. However, we know an awful lot uh, because it's been around for 18 years. So toxicity has been uh, a topic of conversation with the academics and the industrial partners. Graphene itself is not toxic. It's very benign. Uh, it depends on what form it's in. 
we'll all be aware that you know now carbon nanotubes are used in in lots of different applications including tires they they provide you know great performance but there are some challenges with carbon nanotubes because they're very very small diameter compared to their length which makes them very similar to asbestos now a carbon nanotube is a graphene sheet that's been rolled up so there is some concern although in all of the studies that i've seen so far graphene has has not had any effects on toxicology in its purest form there are some other derivatives like uh, graphene oxide which are have other challenges but we're certified to produce up to 10 tons of material in europe through the reach accreditation and that means as part of that accreditation toxicology has been taken into consideration so you have to understand that the at the end of the day, whenever you write with a pencil, you're producing a limited amount of graphene. And as yet, I'm not aware of anybody batting pencils. That makes sense. And of course, as you say, it's an evolving uh, industry. Now, the pitch I had from your public relations people uh, said you were, and I quote, leading the way for Industry 4.0. Now, I can't let that go without asking you to elaborate. What do we mean by that? And uh, in what way are you leading? Industry 4.0 is, uh, that's an interesting uh, topic. and probably an area that uh, is, is probably difficult for us to answer at the moment. So the way that we produce things in the future will be in a totally different way to how we currently produce. We've seen the march of the robot into industry. We've seen uh, the, the amount of communication that's required. All of those things need infrastructure that needs to be improved. So if we're talking about 5G or we're talking about uh, machine-to-machine uh, learning, they all require the fundamentals of change at the heart of that technology. How many times have you picked your mobile phone up and thought, it, once it's a couple of years old, I wish the battery was better, I wish it was quicker, there's more to do on it? Well, that's what industry is going through. Industry is being challenged all the time about the way that it's manufacturing things. And as part of 4.0, what, what we're doing is we're giving it technology that can enable it to overcome some of those challenges. So the way that materials are produced, the way that the machines are produced, the way that the machines communicate, all of those things are, are kind of uh, really, really important. The specific area in which graphene has the most impact, I think, is around sensors. So imagine it, this is uh, not necessarily related to Industry 4.0, although it, it has connotations for that, is that imagine how much more information we currently have about our body, for instance, you know, I don't know if you wear a smartwatch. I do. Uh, I kind of almost forgotten what it's like to wear an ordinary watch now. And when I haven't got it on, uh, I really miss it. Because it's given me information about my heart rate. It's given me information about uh, my breathing rate. It's telling me how active I am. Well, that was kind of science fiction a few years ago. But imagine if that technology was actually built into a transfer that you put on when you got out of the shower in the morning. And it could predict if you were close to having a heart attack or if you're suffering from the effects of long COVID or that you're in a very, very stressful position and you, you, need, to, you need to calm down or being able to self-diagnose medical conditions. And as you, know, as you said, we're, we're all getting older. And, you know, sometimes I think I'm 17 and sometimes I think I'm 70, depending on what, normally what the weather's like. But what I've noticed as I've become older is that that information is now a requirement. It's not a luxury. And uh, the more information I have about my sleep patterns, uh, it, the, the better it is. And so for industry, it's exactly the same challenge. As I said to you before about you know making textiles, we need to te make textiles far more efficiently. We need to make batteries far more efficiently, solar panels far more efficiently. Every aspect of industry needs to be optimized. And that's where these sensors come into play. Right, that makes a lot of sense. And that's going to have some impact on uh, the consumer as well as on industry, of course. What other um, areas, are there any other areas imminent where uh, the person in the street is going to start seeing a difference because of, the, because of your efforts? Well, one of the areas that uh, I've just come off a meeting just before this one, Guy, one of the areas, we're challenges. We're, we don't look at the world in the same way. And I used to think that that was a drawback, uh, but now I've, I've come to acknowledge that it's a bit like having a pair of sunglasses on and seeing the world in a different color. Because I, I look at industry or industries, you know, say the house building industry. Most people of our age group have a house. We've worked hard. You know, we owe the bank. Uh, we've got a mortgage. But if, 
we want to change houses, we have to then you know, move and all of that kind of complexity. What if I could arrive at your site, your plot, and with a, with a house that's fit for purpose for maybe one or two years, and then actually when you've outgrown it or you want to go the other way and you want a slightly smaller house, we take the house away and replace it with a house which is exactly to your requirements. And so these 3D printed structures could be made to suit your exact requirements at that time. And, uh, and I can see that that's a real probability. You know, if, you're a, if you've got kids and you're, you know, you're worried about them getting on the property ladder, I don't think that generation are going to want the same types of houses that we necessarily have. They don't socialize in the same ways. You know, they don't, uh, they don't use their houses in the same way that we do. So they may want a completely different construction. And, and we're just literally about to start printing our first 3D printed concrete house, uh, structures, so I say not houses, structures that demonstrate how that technology may adapt and, and, and change over the next 10 years so that actually things like house building, you know, becomes a completely different, a completely different proposition to what it is now. And we have a house which is absolutely suitable for our needs, you know, whether that's when we first start off and it's just us as post students or yeah, we have a we, we we settle down and have our first relationship, and so we need a slightly bigger house with a spare bedroom. And then we, ha- you know, the natural progression of things is that you know we may have children, so we probably need a couple more bedrooms. And then the natural order of things is those children grow up, uh, you know, they leave home, and we're left with uh, a house that probably needs to be downscaled. But we quite like living where we live. We quite like the environment we're in. Uh, the people that are around us, our family. And so we don't necessarily want to move house. We just want to change the structure of that house. And we'll be able to do that with 3D printing. Right. And I suppose the first uh, uh, structures to be put in place like that will end up as grade two listed printouts. Um, <laughs> finally, um, sorry, flip and comment. Just please ignore me. But uh, uh, do tell us uh, to finish off, uh, where can listeners find out more about yourself and your organization? Uh, so we're quite active on uh, all the social media channels. So uh, on Twitter at Neil Ricketts uh, or at Viserian, Facebook and YouTube, the usual channels. We, we hope to be uh, doing more of these podcasts. And um, and so uh, you'll find those on our website as well, which is Viserian.com, which we're in the process of having a, a bit of a rework on as well. Well, I didn't know you were talking to other podcasters. Nonetheless, Neil Ricketts, Chief Executive of Viserian, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Thank you very much. And many thanks to you for listening. That was the Near Futurist podcast with me, Guy Clapperton. Don't forget to have a look at the website at nearfuturist.co.uk or my media training site at remotemediatraining.com. I'll be back very soon.